podcast listeners. If you hear my voice right now, I need you to do something for me. I want you to take out your phone or on your computer, go to Apple Podcasts, search for Ask Your Old Head Podcast. You'll see my, my logo, my little picture, my little image there. Find the show. Please rate and write a review. It's a small thing, but it helps others find this work and find what I'm doing here. And it really, really matters, uh, as small as that may seem. So if you could please do that uh, before we get into the show, I very much appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Let's get into it. Peace. Peace. I'm Justin. Justice Raji. Man. So, um, so this week, um, the, uh, the understand the seed wonder of, of North Carolina, uh, <laughs> the, the one Steph Curry, uh, the, the bigger than most of y'all, but y'all think he's small human. Yeah. Uh, cause he's six, three. I just want everybody to know that, that that means that if you ever seen a picture of me and majestic, you're like, wow, just you're like a big guy. He's two inches taller than me, you know, with it, probably with his shoes off. Just, you know, right. put it out there. You know what I mean? Now, it might be more slim or sl- more slight or whatever, but I just think NBA players are consistently like, oh, look how small that person is. And, like, they're six foot. They're not small. They're smaller than the other gigantic humans. <laughs> but anyway. Right, right. It's kind of like one of those things, a law of averages, but you generally have everyone that's on the extreme end of one of the law of averages together. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so... Yeah, but the uh, the Golden State Warriors defeated the, the Boston Celtics uh, to win the NBA Finals. And I thought just you know, before we get into other stuff that it was worth, you know, at least uh, touching in on it as it as I watched it. And the only thing I could keep thinking was just for somebody to tell Boston that, that the Warriors don't have any shot blockers. So, like, you know, just go to the rim. <laughs> stop, stop shooting. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's easy for me to say. It's, it's a whole other thing to do while you're trying to do it. But you know, what I mean, um, yeah, I thought it was entertaining, and and just for the, the, you know, for the record, I think it's interesting that, uh, like, the the thing that I most enjoy about Steph Curry is and is folks sort of limiting him and the way he plays to like, but he just shoots jumpers. But if you watch, if you actually pay attention, like he does shoot jumpers, but he actually goes to the rim a lot and like yeah. runs around and he's moving and it's fundamentals and, and, and he also totally wants to beat you. And I, I just, you know, I admire people that are like, I want to beat you, you know, it's nothing personal. <laughs> like <laughs> it ain't about you necessarily, but I want to win. And, and I think that that, aspect um as him just as a contributor to like the history of the game and the history to athletic of athletics is sort of like you know and like at no point should the competitor in 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 him as the leader of that team and the unquestioned leader of that team like if you just pay attention like everybody's like he's the he's the leader <laughs> like we, we with that guy um you know down to dudes on the road you know in rotation like everything um and then just as a you know for whatever it's worth there, uh, you know, you know, I think uh, Joe Liga sometimes probably goes over the top a little bit, but I think amongst his peer group, that's you know, his form of uh, wearing a big gold chain or getting a really expensive car for no particular reason or whatever various thing of status flouting that one may do within the, the, the circle of their peers and maybe you know, uh, super super uh, socially engaged folks, you know, maybe it's you know, the way you know, you know, you, where you purchase your coffee from or something that you like. I, I only get this kind of coffee because I'm I'm dedicated, you know, what I'm saying to the to the to the future, <laughs> right? So it is all the same human behavior, you know, what I'm saying with different strains of uh, where you know we all are engaged in some type of activity where we're engaging with our peers with at least some degree of like, look at y'all, look y'all, look at me being us, you know, what I'm saying. So I just don't want to feel Joe like it feel castigated, <laughs> but say that to say um their leadership should be applauded for keeping together enough of a team and making the, the moves that were necessary that you could have the opportunity to get well another title out of that group because um i thought it was in there i mean i thought you know i actually was my you know if if Kurt clay didn't get hurt was it two years ago i really really wanted the warrior afc warriors versus the one seed rockets 
with Harden and Russ so I could watch Steph Curry beat Harden and Russ because <laughs> that's what would have <laughs> happened. And I would have been like, I tried to tell y'all. <laughs> them dudes well, that would have been a it. that would that would have been a a series between an actual team and two guys who just like to shoot the basketball. It would have been like yeah. when the one guy, like a summer league, when one dude pulls up, he's just really good. But they play like a team that really playing together, and maybe no one's actually as good as the one guy on the other team, but the other one's actually an actual team, right? So, anyway, but you know, props to them. So, does any. NBA Finals thoughts? Yeah, well, a couple things real quick. I mean, one, I often think about the impact that Steph Curry has had on basketball broadly. Um, Mm -hmm. I watched a 30 for 30 um, documentary, right, on the N1 League. Mm. And it was really interesting to watch, and anyone who, you know, is into basketball should watch it. But it was really interesting to watch how many moves Steph Curry does from the N1 time. As much as we think about Steph Curry and his father played and he's the best pure shooter ever to play, Curry wiggles. Mm -hmm. Curry wiggles on you if he gets a chance. Like, he does some stuff that does – he does some shit straight, frankly, right out of the the, uh, the N1 stuff. (laughs) Right? Like, so, you know what I mean? It's certain moves. So, I always think about – He's one of the few players in NBA history that like, and I think it's changed basketball and we get debate how how it has in some ways, but he's the one player that even though he's 6'3 and everyone thinks he's like a a lily putting, you think you can be him. Like we all wanted to be like Michael Jordan, but none of us knew we were like Michael Jordan. Right. Like you, you just you're not like Michael Jordan. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're not like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You're not like Larry Bird. You damn sure not even like Vinny the Microwave Johnson, mm-hmm. right? Like yep. you're just you're not like these people, right? Like, but you and you're not LeBron, right? Like physically, right? Right. Him is the guy that you think you're like. Not even like AI. As much as you could be like you're like Iverson, like you know something's different there. This guy is like the guy you think you could be because he's a pure shooter. And again, he does have these other moves. So I've always thought about his impact on the league and basketball and now how basketball, I think, is and will be different for the rest of for some time because of the role of Steph Curry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I will say quickly, I think the the Warriors are like the Celtics of being the 80s. Mm. Like the Celtics, by all account, were a very well run organization. They had a black coach. They had uh, um, a black center, a black point guard. And for some reason, we still thought they hated black people. Right. Right. <laughs> like, if you think Vern, had Vernon Maxwell on the bench, like, think about this, man. Right. It's, and it's, we, and yeah, we, we thought because of just American culture that for some reason, Red Arback hated black people. Darn they were Adams, just a villain uh, created. Yeah, Dart Adams put a good piece out about uh that you know basically letting folks know it's all right to root for the Celtics. You know what I'm saying? I I, I'm, I find the link. I put it in the notes. I suggest yeah, folks man. read it. And, you know and and you know I had an opportunity to see a Celtics game. Um, and I listen, man. The energy in the Celtics was the name. You say whatever you want to about Boston when you come out, go to go downtown or whatever. That energy is contagious. So that being said, I feel like. That's how we feel about the Warriors now. It's like, oh man, the Warriors, they just keep doing this or keep winning, or Joe Lincoln just spends all the money in the world. Like, <laughs> they're just a really well run organization. And I'm not particularly fond of the war. I mean, I like the style of basketball they play. Um, I don't know, again, if it's like a Celtics in the 80s thing. I'm not particularly fond of the Celt, I mean, the Warriors per se, but it is not a debate that they are a really well worn team. They, by all accounts, seem to really take care of folks. You know what I mean? Uh, engaged in the broader community. I mean, Steph Curry goes to, to North Oakland and plays basketball on concrete, right? With Mr. Fab, like, he mm-hmm. gives out turkeys and shit. Like, right. you know, guess what? Your favorite basketball player, you're saying he doesn't do that. And <laughs> damn sure ain't Steph Curry. Straight up. Like, he doesn't do that. Like, all these guys y'all like and say that they super real. James Harden doesn't do that. And, and, and damn sure didn't do it in Philadelphia. Too busy in Delilah's. Anyway. 
<laughs> Everybody knows James Harden loves the strip gentlemen's clubs, man. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'm a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's no breaking news here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to expose the secret here, but um, and the, and the third thing I'll say is watching basketball today, and it's I was really thinking about how like our brains are kind of organized. So because we've been seeing dynasties for so long that like this has been really a break in the matrix, mm-hmm. right? Like this is like a break in the matrix, like four different, what, three to four different teams in four years, right? right five right, years. I mean, right. they won twice, but then, you know what I mean? Like you really have this kind of like break in the action of this actually like dominant team. Like I in no way think that the Warriors will win next year, right? No, like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't think that somebody will do something. Someone will get their team together. Someone will get hurt in the NBA. And because there's always this conversation about, let's be real, if if Embiid was in a different place, if Chris Middleton didn't get hurt. I mean, you know, but I just think this is just now the nature of the league. Yeah. That by the end of the NBA season, no one's at no one's at full, you know, potential. I mean, no one's like fully ready. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so. My, my operating hypothesis is that with that basically all of the the really good teams are like right in reach of each other right and then you know within that like Giannis is the only dude I think that's like hitting his prime like in his prime of like super duperness and yeah. so if they could have got through Boston I think they I mean I think they would have beat the Warriors. I think I think the Warriors yeah. would have, would have had nothing they could do to stop him from being Giannis all over them. Like, no. <laughs> by the end of the game, they'd be like, God damn. No. right. And no. but I think like all those teams that are real competitive are not that far apart. So then what that means is the the individual performances in the moment kind of mean a little bit more. The like whatever that happened, and if something ever comes out about what happened to Phoenix, because I feel like something happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yeah. But I feel like something yeah. happened because Phoenix should have won the West. But I feel like something yeah. happened, and Aiton, whatever, mentally, like they, they're, I mean, they maybe on there and they're like, well, we didn't pass the ball to Aiton to let him dunk on people because of something Aiton didn't want to do, or if it was the other way around. Something weird happened, and it was like y'all are something strange here, and then y'all just fell apart, and that was it. I feel like I feel like the Suns are like the Clippers of a certain time, and then we found out like Donald Sterling was like. <laughs> You know, right. like there, there's just something really going on there that's like a facade, and they put together a team that, to your point, by all accounts, should have won the championship, um, and didn't, right? Yeah. Like, but you're, I mean, to your right, I think the teams now are close enough that depending on what eight to ten players suit up, a lot of people can beat a lot of people. Like, there's no one that's like far beyond everybody right and i think there will be a reshuffling because of like the failed experiment that is brooklyn um i think there's a couple of either failed experiments or experiments that are going to have to be reevaluated, mm-hmm. um including philadelphia um and that might be a coaching thing or anything else i think frankly but like you know i think there's going to have to be a couple things and with with that realignment i think you have different teams right and those teams someone else can very well be just very good next year because of those realignments so i mean it's interesting it it doesn't i think it it makes for really good basketball it doesn't make i think for the same level of fan engagement if weirdly enough because you don't have like an antagonist and a protagonist right you don't have like the the heat or the warriors of three years ago. Right. 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 Uh, four years ago, like the juggernaut. Right. And then you don't have the LeBron winning a chip and then you don't have the, you know what I mean? You don't have this kind of like us against the world thing. Now you just have a, a host of really good teams playing for a championship. Right. And, and frankly, not one dominant player, like you said, Giannis has hit his prime and probably is the best player in the league. Um, for for whatever that means at that moment, right? But it's not like when LeBron was far and beyond just the yeah, best yeah, player, yeah. Right. He's like, like, like the floor. Yeah, or like, like when Kobe was, yeah, like when Kobe was just like clearly the best player on the floor, no matter what was going on. So I think 
you know that that's an interesting um an interesting shift in the yeah. league. Yeah, and that's the only other thing I say. I'm gonna, you know, props to Coach Doka and 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 uh, the Celtics. You know, living here in Portland, and he, you know, cat that uh, I don't know totally from here, but basically at least from high school, he's from out here. And I have a lot of friends of friends who, you know, are friends <laughs> and, and invested. So a lot of folks here really, you know, got love for, for him. You know, and not just as a basketball coach, but you know, I've never met the man personally myself. But you know, for all counts, I get he's a stand up dude. You know what I'm saying? So. Like, you know, I think it's actually it's quite a feat to get to the finals in your first year head coach of the team that, quite frankly, looked like it was going off the rails. Oh, <laughs> right? man. No, like, they was man. they was 500, and they had put together the last two-year, year and a half of kind of like, hey, man, what are you guys doing? You know what I'm saying? And he, he turned that thing around. So, listen, it, no one wants to take for credit that he took a team that was supposed to have the smartest coach at that point, which, you know, America, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, America, like, <laughs> but like took this team and saved it. I mean, the Popovich family tree deserves all the respect. I mean, he deserves all the respect in the world, but just like you see when people are coaching. And I think that was the other thing that, that, that happened this series that's different than other series. A lot of the series previously were defined literally by the people on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, again, kind of going back to those other other series and previous series that's defined by who's the best player here and who and he, are they just going to score right this one was like coaching right and i think boston frankly you know just ran out of gas um and and tatum this was his first time in the, in the limelight um and there's something that comes with that um yeah. you know that comes with just the like like you said like their game wasn't just like hey just keep punishing them Right. Like, because that's not their game. Their game is, I mean, Jalen Brown is the only kind of like all of them are slashers, but he's like yeah. a pure slasher. Yeah, right. The, so uh, to go uh, tweet us off from <laughs> Dominique Foxworth, he said, he said, Jalen Brown go to the rim like a football player at the, at the rec league, <laughs> which he does. It's like, yo, here, feel these shoulders. You know what I'm saying? But also sometimes he can't dribble. Every once in a while. Which is well, yeah, but he loses. Yeah, it gets to be too much. Yeah. Um, but I just think, like, you know, yeah, the coach, uh, you know, Coach Doka, like, really did an amazing job with that team to really wrangle them and get them to, like, play at their best, which, again, I think has been lost in, our, lost in basketball because in a lot of these teams now, the smartest player is on the smartest person on in the, in the organizations on the floor. And mm -hmm. that's that whole LeBron thing, right? Like, right. you know what I mean? Where now you get to like, no coaching makes a difference in figuring out who does what is going to decide kind of like who wins. So I think it was, you know, it's gonna, it'll be, it'll be interesting start for next year based on people seeing that the Warriors won again, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's you know I think it's ultimately good for the league as it, it as it has to really in earnest begin you know the end of well quite frankly not just the LeBron era but the LeBron era really just you know this should probably be the bookend on the the Curry era now that you know the Warriors it, in terms of being like a repeat of of a, of a dynasty level performance if if Wiseman turns out to be able to play with the other two young guys they got. Cause the other young guys are like, they got something, but you know, the reality is even pro players that look promising sometimes, you know, they're just they're good NBA players, not necessarily team, you know, players that, you know, create a, a transcendent ability to win. And so, you know, props to them though for, you know, and, and I wish everybody the best. Hope everybody does well, but I think the league should be pretty competitive the next couple of seasons. Like I think, like the the both sides, um, especially the East, but definitely I think the next two seasons, both sides of the of the league, like the playoffs should really be like like some scraps. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like we got to fight through this. You know, I, I actually think I, I I don't know if Christian Wood is a dude that looks too good to be on a bad team, but maybe he's not good enough to be good on a good team. Going to Dallas, I, I would hope for Dallas that it's the latter, but. I mean, not the latter, which is one of yeah, that he's he's good. He's actually a good basketball player that's stuck on bad teams. <laughs> that you know, right. that should not be the the one, but if he's the three, you know, what I mean if he's the he's if he's the inside man or uh, you know, on the rotation, he's the one got to finish when they double uh uh what's my guy? Uh 
Dottich. You know what I'm saying? Then that could be interesting for them, but we'll we'll see. Uh, you know, and I and I do like about Doncic that he definitely has a bit of you know. I, li- I like people that understand in the moment. I am beating your team. I'm going to play for the crowd, and I'm also going to show you up a little bit. I know some people don't like that. I like that. That's why I like when when Steph hit the three and put the put the go to sleep up. I said, "Ooh, yeah, you got to hold that one. <laughs> Rub it in your chest," as our good brother would say. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Rub that in your chest. That's all you, man. You let him do that to you. I didn't let him do that to you. You did. You got to come back next year and uh, get your get your pride back. You know what I'm saying? So, any event, NBA Finals. <sighs> so, um, any other thoughts on that? Before we nah, nothing. Transition, transition. All right. Uh, so the other thing, and I guess it's in light of this because I because I think most people would think of these finals as kind of the first finals that are kind of like back on schedule from since the pandemic started, you know, and I think there's a case that could be made that even I think from said, like, you know, for all the players involved and, and all of us as humans, quite frankly, like that there wasn't an off season. <laughs> we just keep rolling. But <laughs> right. the strangest thing I feel about this moment, and I say this in light of like currently or well, in the last month and a half, including this week, having to do in, inside the house quarantines and rearrangings because somebody in the house did, you know, contract COVID, like, like, the, like we've kind of act like it's over, but it, like it's not over. But I guess, I guess it's you know, I guess we've decided it's over. And with the other things that have happened, and and maybe fortunately for us, the the strain that seems to be running around is not uh as vicious, maybe as the earliest. And please, if someone's a scientist that knows better, you know, what I mean, correct me because I'd rather be right. corrected than be spreading you know misinformation but it's a very strange you know and i've had i say this with this with, within the sight of one traveling quite a bit in the last one and then traveling like within like our household right so me drive you know drove to indianapolis you know last week we you know son spent a week there and you know other people going to other places they went to dc and you know what i mean like so everyone's moving around and doing different things and seeing the way, you know, we're actually traveling across the country, like going in places and, you know, I go to some places that we stopped, you know, the, the folks working, were still wearing masks, other places, the folks working, some folks were wearing masks, some folks weren't wearing masks. And I always, you know, take a barometer myself on whether I should wear a mask, kind of like, well, if they work here and they wearing a mask, it don't cost me nothing to throw a mask on while I'm in here. You know what I'm saying? Out of respect to, you know, folks in here doing their job, you know what I mean? Whatever that job may be, just, you know, that's a Raji for the record. Um, yeah, but it's like a very weird, like, yeah, the pandemic's over, y'all. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's an interesting thing, like, it, and I'm using, again, I want to, like, to your point, I want to say what it appears to be is, I don't know if we're in a pandemic anymore or we're living with the fact that there is a very prevalent um virus right that continues to spread i don't know what percentages make it a pandemic it would make it necessarily a pandemic anymore right like and that's not to say that it's not it's just it's just to say like okay <clears throat> what percentages like was it a place like you know recently you know the cdc has its levels and stuff like that and you know out here it was high maybe like two weeks ago and nothing changed because no one was going to change right like right. nothing like like nothing like nobody put a mask back on um and then it went down the low and no one put a mask back on right so it's kind of like you know I, I always and going back to this man i always look at just how underdeveloped our public health infrastructure is in america on a variety of things mm-hmm. right like it's not just with covid um it's with the flu it's with cold it's with frankly like you know diseases that are not commun you know uh communicable like like cancer like we just don't have really like this built out public health like structure um that allows people to understand how to be healthy and protect themselves and each other right and so I think what, you know, my, my take on it is that when you had the pandemic in its full fledged, it was not deniable of what you had to do and hospitals being overwhelmed and all these kind of things, right? Like 
it wasn't deniable about what you had to do to keep yourself safe or keep someone in your family or someone who was immunocompromised. And then like, as that receded and as the needs of the economy, right, kind of started to take a higher, <laughs> a higher role of importance than people's health, which in America just does generally. Yeah. It's like everybody shifted. Um, and then while there are still very real things about people who are immunocompromised and, and do have these things, because our society is not really structured to give a damn about how other people function. Right. And so we have this weird thing of like trying to compel people to do something, but like that's not the way our the kind of uh, under the structure, right, of our our infrastructure, health infrastructure is created that you just have this thing of people like, uh, whatever. And it's just like, you, you know what I mean? And, you know, it, it's, it's, it was interesting to me. Uh, I was uh, in DC last week and like, in DC, you still have to put a mask on in uh, the Ubers in mm-hmm. like a, a car service, right? But in m- most other places, you don't have to anymore because it's like CDC rules, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it was interesting to watch people and even watch my own adjustment mm-hmm. to like, mm-hmm. okay, got to put a mask on, right? Like, mm-hmm. and it just was that thought because everywhere else, no one else had one on in no way, shape, form, or fashion. You know what I mean? And so I just think across the board, man, it's it's a lot to be said of the psychological ways. I think, frankly, also we were told about the pandemic and the ways that like how it was framed in the beginning. And then, you know, science is a process, not a thing. Right. And I think we've been taught that science is a thing. So as soon as some that mm-hmm. thing has been refuted. Right. People go, oh, just not don't believe in science. <laughs> right. Like, don't believe the science because the one thing has been refuted versus no, it's a process by which you come to learn more. Right. It's a body of not it's a body of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think again, I think just that public health space not being as strong as it should be and the ability to communicate public health to the masses of people um, has now gotten people like, oh, it's over. Even if people are still getting sick, are being hospitalized. And it, you know, the prevalence of this virus still is a, can be a danger to, to some, right? It still, it still can get you sick, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It still can get you sick, just like, you know, and I, I don't know if, you know, we've all made the collective thing. We just got to live with that, um, you know. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, I think that's the you know, for whatever reason, the operational space that we're in is that folks, you know, and, and, or, well, okay, I'll say two things. One, that yes, it's 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 more or less over, you know, like I think I remarked seeing someone that posts something in a group like, yeah, we all just got it and then we moved on, like about being in some other part of the country. And I was just sort of like, really? Did we all move on? Are you sure we're fine? But, you know, even, you know, like I said, I've traveled a bit throughout the state uh, this week, this month, no, I guess last month. And, you know, people just sort of, you know, people just moving on, right? Like, people aren't bringing it up. I mean, you know, no one ever made a big fuss about, to me, about the mask thing. Like, when I would wear a mask, they weren't wearing a mask, which, you know, I think goes to my, I must have, you know, bullshit, the prevention pheromones that I admit or something, because nobody ever, <laughs> nobody ever does the stuff I see on videos on the internet to me. Like, nobody ever, hey, buddy, you don't got to wear that mask, man. Like, don't ever, like, no, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I'm a super tough guy. I feel like I'm a pretty nice person most of the time. I don't think I look intimidating. But for whatever reason, I'm just putting that out there that, you know, I wish somebody would one day just so I could have the experience. I could feel like everybody else. But anyway, the, uh, the general point being that you get around and, you know, it's like folks is just moving through it, right? You know, the data and how much you want to tend to the data, like it, it maybe becomes background music. And it's sort of like, well, I've found whatever my niche and rhythm in the things that I do, you know, so my work to my work movement, my responsibility movement, my picking up my kids, my checking on a family member, my social engagements that I do. And I, I feel safe enough, whether it's rational to feel that safe, that I'm just going to keep moving and not stress about it and then if i do get sick or someone next to me gets sick or a co-worker and we, oh we got to work back from the house or you know we're, we're not doing this this week because you know this happened you know what i mean but um 
it's you know it's still strange there's a couple counties here that did get um elevated uh mask or whatever um recommendation like later but i don't you know then there are all counties that are not gonna <laughs> they're not gonna <laughs> wear masks <laughs> i'll tell you that right now um just from living here and you know other places where it's just to monitor and then i've, I've even found myself yesterday as i was you know traveling through different spaces where you kind of like well i mean I've, I've been wearing a mask usually in this circumstance but i'm like, no one else is wearing a mask and i just need to run in here real quick and i think oh snap I left my actual, my good mask <laughs> is not with me. So let me just run in here, do what I need to do, and I'm going to try to get out, and hopefully everything will be okay, right? It's 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 a, yeah, it's an interesting, you know, again, I, I think, you know, when the those who do the academic research on these sorts of things and documenting the sociological impact and whatnot of this, this will be written down as sort of the end of the pandemic and the transfer to whatever the next level it is, and this is all, you know, justice talking in June of 2022 and no weird extra ill variant hasn't popped out of the wilderness, of the wilderness on us. No, um, that's, that's <laughs> very true because June of last year, I felt one way. And then a lot of the people I knew that had never gotten contracted COVID contracted it like in the last month or two of last year of, of 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, no, we're, we're all just one crazy variant away <laughs> from right from um, yeah. whatever yeah right. so i don't know man I, I think it bears monitoring and and bears just like you know keep an eye on but you know i i definitely do it would be nice if it, if if you know whatever we're at now is not that this is good but that it doesn't you know return to some other you know worse but worse uh, situation or state the only other thing it does impact you know I mean, I guess some other like, you know, convention type travel and uh, events or, you know, and I'm like, man, I'd like to go to this. And then part of me is like, is this a good thing to go to? I guess it'll be all right. I mean, maybe it won't be all right, but I really would like to go. But I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's just, uh, but, you know, maybe I'm the only one that's worried. Maybe everybody else is cool. We'll see. So no, hey, no, I know some folks that listen, trust me, from out, listen, I see some people that still worry. And, and as, as well, they should be, right? Like, they should be worried because they may have conditions for themselves or in their families or that, you know, um, and I think we do need to have, uh, you know, the proverbial softer eyes with each other in regard to, OK, if you're if, however you may take it, that there are other people that for a variety of reasons, you know, have to try to make sure that they don't contract something that could compromise, um, you know, the the system of other people that they, that they care for. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, in our last footnote or, or section uh, uh, of our conversation today, it is black music month. And I thought it would be a good way to just in this first recording or conversation that we would have this month to, you know, touch on uh, some aspect of that. And, and, and uh, maybe we can come back to it in another time before the month's out but i thought would be interesting is maybe like three artists or three things or if you can get to three i don't know if i got three but i got at least two um that you know you just wanted to touch base or highlight you know for black music but you know what i'm saying yeah i mean so the first one for me and i guess it's very kind of very specific to this time is um <clears throat> the new Drake album that just dropped, um, you know, it was a well, never mind uh, the title. Um, and so, you know, it's, he dropped a surprise album and I think it's about 14 songs and only one song of rapping. Um, most of it is some variation of what I'll call dance music. I mean, some of it is clearly house in, in, in its varying forms. Um, you know, some, Chicago house, some Jersey, Baltimore, Jersey club music slash Baltimore house music. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's unique. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's being generally panned, um, by folks who are thinking that it was going to be different. And for that, I have a couple thoughts. One of my thoughts is like the reality of it is that like Drake, Drake always puts, um, music out 
that is, you know, kind of varied and, and alternative, right? It's not, he doesn't just, I mean, the guy sings and puts out R&B songs, right? Um, he's gotten into world music. He's gotten into drill. So I think Drake, as an artist, is a, frankly a global artist that doesn't kind of stay in one lane. Yeah. Um, and I think he should be applauded for that, frankly. Um, I think a lot of, you know, hip hop artists, um, or, you know, what a lot of artists that are in who frame themselves in the genre of hip hop. Um, sometimes we can forget that there are other forms of music and other forms of music have had a huge impact on making what hip hop is right. Usually literally and often using the samples of those things to form the music. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's like one thing. Two, I think it, it makes you think about the fact and this is something that I've, for most people who are listening to this podcast, um, know, but I think it always bears repeating that house music is fundamentally black music. Yep. Um, techno has its origin in black, and in, in, in is in a black music that then obviously people from all across the world create, do now, right? And it's important to to, to say that because you know, you listen to house music and especially if someone listens to it, maybe like in the last 20 to 25 years, even 30. I mean, you and I both know the whole history of of house music, um, specifically in Jersey, um, in Jersey club music that then kind of, at least in Philly, reemerged via the Baltimore culture, right? Mm -hmm. The like Baltimore house music um, in in like the mid 2000s. but like, yeah, I think it's for people to to really recognize that, okay, if he did this album, it's still black music. Like, just because you hear it in, you know, a hotel lobby or at a, you know, you hear it at, at Privé or you hear it at a, what's the, the, the club at the Fountain Blue, like on a night, on a, yeah, like on a night, yeah, like on a night that's not hip hop. Like just because you hear it there doesn't mean that it's not black music. And we have to make sure that we don't forget those things. I think the same thing that traditionally happened happened to rock and roll. And now there's a lot of information around people trying to make sure that they reinforce. You know, Ali Asha does a really good job of like kind of showing the black uh, origins of rock and roll. But we have to do the same thing for house music. House music as a music is a black music that started in Chicago. Like that is not debatable. Yeah. So if Drake wants to do this kind of music, well, you know, listen, man, I say, go ahead, knock yourself out. You know what I mean? Uh, some of the vocals are trash, but you know, um, but that that's his fault. That's not the, that's not the music that black coffee gave him. Right. And black coffee for those who don't know is a, a really big, uh, you know, electronic artist, out of South Africa, um, huge global artist, right? So, you know, Black Coffee gave him the beats. It's kind of like if, you know, if Kanye or Pharrell gave somebody beats and they did, they did, 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 <laughs> with the instrumentation that was provided yeah, there, you know what I'm saying? With that composition they were given, man. So, but no, but like, no. So that's one. Real quick, um, I'll give two and then we'll do, go back back and forth maybe on the third one. The second one uh, that I've really been thinking about is I've uh, been listening to, there's a, there was a label out of Detroit in the 70s called Strata Records. Um, it was a pioneering jazz uh, label that it actually at one point then had its own kind of partner label, Strata East in New York, um, of you know what we traditionally now would call like soul jazz, um, which is you know kind of like that space where jazz was getting more the kind of deeper vocals, and sometimes was starting to have more of the soul slash rhythm and blues sound, but still had that deep kind of like lush instrumentation. Um, I think you still you, you hear some of it in kind of the transitions that was happening in. Um, Philadelphia International, like in the in mid, mid to late seventies, right? Where you had like these artists who were obviously jazz artists who were adjusting to this new world. But anyway, so there was the best of this record label that had then got remixed by Jazz Anova, which is a Berlin, um, a Berlin based band, and DJ Amir, who is from Boston originally. Um, and I've been listening to it and just really thinking about the power of 
finding black music from other times and if people do do like a remix to it or something like that like the power of bringing it up to a kind of contemporary stage where people can appreciate it mad lib has done a lot of that Mm -hmm. um you know and i think that's really important for new generations because what our current intake of music we have there's so much music being created at, at such a fast pace and given to us such a fast pace. And then the structures that we listen to music compel us not to listen to whole projects and frankly, to be in an algorithm to not really hear something outside of what you're used to hearing. That is important that music that was created and that has historical context to it be kind of uh, remixed um, for the for the current time. So. Yeah, yeah. That's peace. Yeah, so I like those notes, and and just for I, I I always catch up to Drake records like way later, and like or some 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 hits filtered to the top, and then when I find a chance, I try to go you know every once in a while. I'll, at least several record, Drake records. I'm just keeping real. I ain't never even tried to listen to the whole record, so you know I'll be a dinosaur if I want to. Y'all can you know y'all go <laughs> y'all can go feel how you feel about it. But I do I do be liking what Drake does, and I, and I, I do <laughs> applaud him for trying stuff because there's no reason really not to i mean and, and, and again it's it's actually sort of weird to hear people it's not like he's out here doing boom bap you know what i'm saying 90s style like keep it real like, <laughs> like right. that's not what y'all right. want y'all ain't about that life come on man cut it right. out you know what right. i'm saying but in any of it and also on that jazz tip, and, and 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 that's just the, the depth of music that's been created because the one thing um that is surfaced sometimes and maybe it is for not for others but when you if you scroll down to the like artists that are like this artist uh, on you, whatever streaming app or however you listen to music, you know, or if, if you happen to still frequent a record store, you know, cause that's some way I used to find stuff that I didn't know was like, if I knew about one artist in a genre, go to where that's at right in the store and then just sort of, you know, feel around and maybe buy, you know, buy something I don't really know if it's good. Just, just give it a shot, right? You know what I'm saying? I think that's one of the first ways I, I listened to, like, a King Brit, like, album, you know, CD, was I, like, just bought one on the Humbles because I had heard of King Brit. I didn't really know King Brit, all like that. Then I learned, I kind of like King Brit. I kind of dig what he's doing over here, right? Um, You know, that sort of thing and, uh, you know, other similar type of artists. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's props, I'd say. The first one that I, I I put on this game on because uh, I, and I don't know all of the the musical stylings of the one Little Beaver, but if you're familiar with a song called "Get Into the Party Life," you know what I'm saying, Woo! which is a you know a, a bona fide at least that's his most played on the Spotify. You know what I'm saying, like you know, I guess that's funk blues funk. I, it feels bluesy funk to me. Um, yeah. You know, from 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 that era. But, you know, and then I found some other songs that are songs that have been sampled that folks know and maybe don't tie to, um, to you know, don't know Little Beaver as artists. I'm just enamored by the idea that your name was Little Beaver. That like, that was like, yo, what you going to name? Little Beaver, baby. <laughs> Little Beaver. You know what I'm saying? I got so many questions. Like, is Beaver, is it just, is, is there a big beaver? Is is there something to do with your hat? You always have is to it... think that in, in our community, you got to be like, well, that was Lil Beaver. Big Beaver must have been his pop or his uncle with them. Like, well, that was a dude from around the corner. Like, it, it even just the idea that you'd be like, yeah, man. So um, we're going to put this record out. So what, 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 what are we thinking about? Little Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then the idea, you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, um, you know, Props to Ali Ash actually there's a, there's a playlist he sent me that he made on Spotify that had a couple other tracks from him. And there's just you know, it's one of those things you start listening to a certain age of music and you're like, oh, man, it's, it's like a whole depth of that world. You know what I'm saying? What was happening? And I'm in the midst of reading a couple different things. Um, well, currently reading them definitely about like the civil rights era itself, but like the post civil rights era and then you like kind of that understanding that age of music from different angles. Right. And so I've enjoyed that and I've uh, made it my pledge to, to dig a little deeper in the Little Beavers catalog. You know what I mean? See what else is out there. You know what I'm saying? And then um, a second one that was on my list to listen to more uh, is uh, actually it was it was it started with um, when we was watched we were talking about the uh, what's it called? What's the name? The, the black the Brit. Uh, 
Why oh, can't I remember the name of it? The Black Brit John. The um, uh, it's not dance hall, but it's like the late uh seventh eighties. Oh, lovers rock, lovers rock type joints. And um, and I just you know try to do my best to um, like just keep flipping through stuff that is associated as lovers rock just to hear more of that music, right? Because there's a lot of actually a lot of you know a lot of dope songs in there, and and then also though. You know, for me, it's an opportunity to sort of connect with, you know, I guess I would say growing up where I grew up, a community that leases, you know, sometimes had relatives that, you know, I grew up around a lot of the Jamaican and Haitian community in in in, in Willingboro. Shout out to Willingboro. And, you know, sometimes folks might have folks over across the pond or wherever. And I think right. that from a diaspora rural connection perspective, from just the way music um moves around in a way folks take uh take pieces or use stuff and still express their own you know unique sound so i tried to like you know lean into that i don't have no particular artist but i do you know it does lovers rock does it plays well like when you you know you you, you cleaning the cleaning the house making some food maybe you're having a get together you know what i mean the lovers rock is like you know, it, it's, it's mellow enough to be mellow, but got a little energy, you still can dance to it. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's it's, it's nice. Some of it, you know, it, it is heavy on the like, you know, man, I love you, don't leave me. <laughs> or like, yeah. my heart will break in all so many pieces. <laughs> you know? Yes, you it, definitely, it definitely was like their take on American soul music. Baby, 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 please, baby, 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 please. baby, 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 please. <laughs> baby, baby, please, baby. You know what I'm saying, but you know, if you, if you you know, it ain't a bad, it ain't a bad thing every once in a while. Listen to a little baby, baby, please. So, you know, I encourage folks to 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 dip in. I uh, I was trying to remember the one particular joint, um, but I, it'll come to me. You know what I mean? But you know, get out there and express yourself and some other. You know, so yeah. So you have one more thing? Yeah, yeah. I guess in that in that vein, um, just really. Two artists I'll share, kind of in the vein of UK jazz. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised, um, and I think jazz is blooming across the world. So this is not like a shot at America, because uh, it doesn't need to be, because America's where jazz began. But like, I would say that, um, in America, we you know we have a relationship with jazz. Unfortunately, that it means like it's not funky, that it's not cool, that it's like someone's parents or grandparents thing. And I think that happens because of the American fascination with from Duke Ellington and Benny Golson all the way to like Coltrane, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, Miles and Coltrane. And it kind of like goes, runs this gamut of like 19, you know, or Louis Armstrong, of course, I would never want to me- not mention Satchel, but it, it, it kind of runs this gamut from like the 20s and 30s to like 1968, right? Right. right. <laughs> and so that's just like where you frame this music. And so as a result, although there's been so much more music created in that vein, we kind of frame it there or it's like, Wynton Marsalis kind of not liking hip hop in the nineties. Right. right? right. So it it just been given like this thing that I think in America now, obviously so many great uh, artists, the Robert, the Robert Glaspers of the world, you know what I mean? Christian McBride's. I mean, so many, I don't, you know, I'd be trying to, uh, we'd be here all day trying to say all of them, but like why you have that, I think the folks in the UK, because they're different, um, or they're different like influences. They have taken jazz and done some slightly different things with it. Um, and two artists that I'll share um, for, you know, for folks to check out is one Alpha Mist, and that's um, A-L-F-A-M-I-S-T. He's mm-hmm. like a composer, much in the vein of like, kind of like a Jay Dilla, um, you know, and just, uh, he actually did a American tour recently for the first time and sometime um, tours regularly across Europe. Um, but just really, really quality music, really good vocalist. And also uh, Yasmin Lacey. And Yasmin Lacey has kind of like what we would think is the traditional kind of like soul singer energy, kind of like Jill Scott um, energy. But she very jazzy, as Jill Scott is, um, mm-hmm. but also kind of has a different musical palette. You know, because in the you know, in Europe, folks can uh, they can use drum and bass kind of like a drum, like a jazz drum and bass esque sound, right? Where mm-hmm. again, 
you know, the 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 great thing is that hip hop has done so much to do so much in America. But the bad thing is it's kind of framed as like this is the only music people want to listen to. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and, and right before, you know, up until this recent kind of, you know, and me and Knowledge Bill always talk about this, like this idea of Afrobeat which is like not the afro beat that afro beat was right <laughs> but it's like it's like right. a new afro beat you know what i'm saying cuz like it's like this afro beat it's kind of like no like tony allen and, and fela kuti right i was like right you just they they coming out the back is it it's, it's like okay but like no like this is this is some other variation of like world music slash kind of the the music that was being created kind of like in the 2000s so it's like it's really an interesting space that you're like oh that's that that artist is called afrobeat now i was like oh okay all right cool but like but i will say that there's yeah, it's more of a global bent so folks get to check out yasmin lacy or um or alpha mist i yeah. would say yeah. um and i think it just helps to to understand that again black music is global and that black music month doesn't always have to be just continuing to celebrate james brown Louis, Louis Armstrong, right. Duke Ellington, Aretha like, Franklin. you know what I mean? Right, Aretha right. Franklin, and I like, like yo, and I, yeah, like all of that black out. music, black music is, you know, soca, <laughs> soca is black music, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, reggae is black music and not just Bob Barley, I understand, you know what I mean? Right. Not right. just Bob Barley, not just Shabba Ranks, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> Depending how old you is, like you still think about Tinga Ling a Ling is like right. your reggae introduction. Um, you know what I'm saying? So exactly. like getting getting beyond getting beyond those spaces, I think it's good just as we kind of deal with like a global blackness. Yeah, yeah. Word, word. No, and I just actually uh got came across a couple alpha miss joints um some point in the last like two months. I was like, ooh, I like that. Um yeah, and I would say. Yeah, I don't got a third. I'll just say, you know, get out there and listen to some more music, man. Spread your horizons. You know what I mean? You know, don't feel like you're going if you if you're in a, if you're in a box, you know what I mean? Go ahead and get out that box, man. You can go ahead and listen to whatever you want to. It's a lot, it's a lot of music to be heard, you know what I'm saying, in a lot of ways folks come. So um I've seen something on, on the Twitter box. I don't always be having time to participate in these various little oh post your thing. That's whatever thing. I don't but you know, there's someone that they uh been posting sort of like different you know, song that you sing when da 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 for Black Music Month, you know, that kind of thing. It looked look like, you know, look like good fun. So, you know, in my 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 esteem, the folks is, you know, if you if you, you want to engage in Black Music Month, if you, um, you know, not to mention Juneteenth, you know what I'm saying, and, 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 and our new kind of national conversation on uh, what freedom means in America. Um, maybe we'll oh, get to that man. next, maybe we can get to that oh, next week. Man. We'll see. All I'm gonna say is, you know what I'm saying, go listen to some some music and uh, you know, enjoy your weekend. You know what I'm saying, and it's Father's Day. If somebody wants to sleep in their father, man, let them do that. Okay, America. And don't get him. And don't get even no tie if you don't wear ties. Straight. And don't up. get no slippers. He don't need no slippers. <laughs> don't don't be trying to get people stuff that everybody be always trying to get. Listen, and don't be getting no grill just so he can go cook. Unless right. unless that's his thing. Just like just is. A one, so just yeah. one of the grill. Then fam, give him a grill. That's cool. But don't be getting nobody no grill so they can go out and do labor. <laughs> right, <laughs> power tools. Like that. <laughs> right, you know right. No more things to effectuate the things that need to be done around the house. You go out there and do some manly stuff. Put some. Put some <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this is hilarious too. I, I, I'll, I'll say for <laughs> future conversation because I've been doing some, some house fixing stuff and I. Helping freedom with his spot, and uh, and the brother's like, yeah, I mean, you do this because you got to take care of the place, not because, you know, like I, I don't want this for my leisure. I want <laughs> right. I want something leisurely for my leisure time. But you know, that's all I'm saying. Just you know, for the record. But in any event, um, that's all I got. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. No, no, for, no, for good order. All right. So with that I say, peace. Peace. Thank you for listening to Good Brothers. Thank you to my good brother, I'm Majestic. Uh, Ash Oldhead is a creative project created by me, produced by me, uh, with the intent of creating space for exploration and understanding of, you know, masculinity, manhood, various things, at least within the purview and the study and the frame in which I experienced it. Uh, anyway, if you want to support the podcast, one of the number one ways is to share the podcast. Uh, 
bring it out, give it to them, somebody else to listen, put it on for them, uh, play it in the in the background while you're making potato salad this summer, whatever have you. Um, but also, you can support by becoming a patron on Patreon. Just search for Justice for IG, and you can support me with a little monthly something um, that uh, contributes and helps keep the keep the lights on, so to speak. You can also search for the Etsy shop and purchase a T-shirt or sweatshirt or mug um, whatever suits you uh, no pressure though you know what I mean I appreciate you listening and uh, please share listen rate wherever you listen to podcasts and I'll you know continue to do the rest I do want to announce that I will be getting to affect um, the profile pieces that I used to do regularly and my intent is to get those rolling um, and interviews done in the coming months and by the fall be able to start sharing those well there's some other things so in any event please keep listening and thank you and be well peace